right, we are live on the Andre Duke Show. I got Big Matt McChesney joining me from uh, Six Zero Academy, uh, the owner operator, former NFL player, former CU Buff. Um, just started his new podcast, Zero to Sixty. Uh, welcome to the show, Matt. What's up, brother? How are you, man? I'm doing good. I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Absolutely. I'll jump, jump right in real quick. Um, your your guy got fired, Josh McDaniels. I seen that last night. Uh, yeah. So look, Josh McDaniels, you know, he's you know just he's a recycled head coach in the National Football League, and he he dismantled a franchise in Denver, and you know traded away a lot of talent and set the franchise back, and then the Raiders thought that looked like a great idea. And they decided to give him another shot. And he dismantled a franchise in Vegas and traded away a lot of talent and cut a lot of people and got rid of Darren Waller and got rid of Carr. And, you know, now they're stuck with a bunch of New England uh, cast offs and guys, you know, that kind of just mi- migrated west the same way they did uh, back in the day in Denver when I was there. So, it, McDaniel's, uh, I can see him going back to New England with his, with his thumb in his mouth, like asking Daddy for a job. So, um, you know, it, it's it's not surprising that he lost uh, another opportunity. He's just not NFL head coaching material, bro. That's a fact. I would uh, I would agree with you on that. And then his treatment of players, the Chandler Chandler Jones situation, just not a good look. I I think the guy will be a career coordinator in my opinion it's just yeah i mean stand. look he'd probably go get a college job somewhere he might be better suited at, at that position honestly with how he likes to run stuff but it's kind of a it's kind of a dead you know narrative you can't really treat people like that in this business anymore especially with social media and everybody having a voice if you want to be you know vindictive and you want to hold grudges the way mcdaniels does it usually doesn't go well Right on. Um, and with you being in Denver, um, what is the outlook? Is there optimism in Denver about the Broncos that they could maybe turn this around, salvage the season? I mean, yeah, man. This is the first time they've beaten uh, Kansas City in my youngest son's life. <laughs> so that's good. Um, and, and he's nine. So I, I just – I like the win. I like the back-to-back wins. I think that they can. I think they can beat Buffalo in Orchard Park after a week off. You know, coming off a bye, if they do it right, Buffalo doesn't really impress me. I mean, they're good. They'll probably compete for a playoff spot. They may win the East. You never know. Uh, Miami looks pretty pretty good. So, like, yeah, they can pull out of this. Even if they do lose to Buffalo, they've got winnable games on the other side. And it's all about your schedule and how you're playing. You know, you can get into the playoffs with seven, maybe even eight losses. The AFC is really deep. You know, the, the the Broncos have a very, very competitive defense when they want. And, you know, they gave up 70 points at one point, but they've also held the Chiefs in two games in three weeks to 25 total. So I think that's really who they are as opposed to the – team that went to Miami two days early and like had a mini vacation and went to Tootsie's and like, you know, fucked around. That's just probably not a good look. So, you know, the, the Bronco team that we see now that's focused and seems to have figured out the best way to play last week, Sean Payton called 40 runs and 19 throws and Russell Wilson had 114 yards passing, but three touchdowns. So that's effective and efficient. It's not about Pat statting. It's about, winning so if russ doesn't cook they win and he can just ride the wave of winning and be the you know the piece of the puzzle that is there to execute the offense not necessarily win games right on um we can we can transition a little bit from the broncos uh what about the air force falcons i mean that that is a tough team they went up to wyoming took care of business um, I gamble a little bit and I've been winning money on the Falcons. Yeah, look, Air Force is, I mean, look, they've been consistently the best program in Colorado for a long time. And they, I think they finally have the team to beat Boise. 
And that's going to be a huge test. It's the last game of the season. Um, it's going to be for the division. And it, look, Air Force's defense is super legit. Super legit. And, you know, Coach Knorr is, is a great coach for them on the defensive side. Coach Calhoun and everything he does, the way they recruit, the way they develop, the way they play. They can throw the ball a little bit too this year, which makes them even more, you know, indefensible. I think Air Force, and I'm bullish on this, and I'm rooting for it, obviously, but I think Air Force is, has the potential to win the Mountain West undefeated and get to the Fiesta Bowl as like an, an at-large bid. And I'll say this, there is not a Division One Power Five program in America that wants to play Air Force in the Fiesta Bowl if they're undefeated. They, they will never get a more motivated team than Air Force this year undefeated. Now, if they may be a year early, I hope that they can keep it going next year and go undefeated again so they can get in the 12-team playoff because if, it, you know, they're not getting in a 14-team playoff, even if they are undefeated, they'll make the Fiesta Bowl. But next year, if they were undefeated, they would make the 12-team playoff. And that, as an 11 or 12 seed, they'd be playing the one or two team in America, undefeated Air Force with that triple option in defense. That would be like a probably a 14-point favorite that I, I might take money line depending on who they're playing. I mean, no, no defense in the SEC or the Big Ten, the Big 12, whatever, ACC, if you want us to take the top teams, you know, Pac-12, they're all going to struggle with the triple option and how Air Force plays defense. It's just a fact. So if you look at all the Power 5 teams that they mop up every time they play a bowl game or a non-conference game, you know, the, the Air Force Falcons are always for real, and they I, I hope and pray that they go undefeated this year and end up in the Fiesta Bowl. That would be dope. Yeah, that really would. And uh, I've watched Air Force uh, a lot, and uh, I feel like they just play that brand of football, that just downhill, we're going to meet you in the A-gap, and we're going we're gonna to bring it to you. Yeah, they're, they are super physical, and that's what they hang their hat on. And – Again, that's why the teams in Power 5 struggle. They don't play the option often. You only have a, a limited amount of time to get ready for it. I guess in a playoff situation, they would have about three weeks to a month to get ready for it. So I would expect great coaches to be able to do that. But at the same time, preparing for it with guys that don't know how to run it and don't know the mesh points and the timing, and then playing against the Air Force where that's what they do, I think it could be a huge problem for the massive programs and, and may, they may not win, but they'll give them a hell of a game. You know, the, the air force Falcons are as good of a program in America. And honestly, look, if I'm the PAC 12 and I'm about to lose 10 members, I'm inviting air force, army, Navy, all three of the service academies. I'm inviting Tulane. I'm inviting San Diego state, Boise, every, just move everybody into the new PAC 12 and roll you know, and the, the service academies can have a home again where they can actually play for big time trophy trophies again and you know, throw back to the fifties and sixties. Right on. I I a hundred percent agree with that, with merging the Mountain West. And I I think Oregon State has made huge investments. I've never been to that campus, but uh, I've seen the the pictures of the stadium. They've made huge investments and Washington State is no slouch and uh I just, I just feel like that would be a good fit for them. All them schools are right there in that time zone. It would cut down on the travel. I mean, for the, you know, the ACC uh, traditionalists adding Stanford and Cal, that's a logistics nightmare in my opinion. I mean, yeah, nobody wants to be on a plane that fucking long. Absolutely not. And uh, we'll move on to the uh, the guys that speak ba-ba. Oh, uh, yeah, these guys. <laughs> uh do you think uh, he could put a winner together up there? I, look, I think Norvell is a hell of a coach. Um, it, you know, he poked the bear this year and lost, and that's okay. The next year will be a home game in Canvas. I, uh, I think they could. I mean, I'd like to think they can. Yeah, I mean, they need to do a way better job recruiting the state of Colorado. Like. It, it's it can't be a non an, an afterthought like you can't let quality football players keep going to Wyoming and keep going to Boise State that should be going to Colorado State so the the you know the facilities are beautiful and I think that they've got 
a lot of potential, but they've also, you know, this isn't Jane Norvell's problem, but when you look at two kids particular from Fort Collins, Trey Zoon, who's the starting left tackle at Texas A&M, and Gage Genther, who's going to go to Tennessee this year, both from Fossil Ridge, both guys from my program. I mean, they didn't even offer Trey back in the day because they didn't think they could recruit him. And what if he wanted to play there his whole life? I mean, that's not the way to do things. And then they, they did offer Gage, but they didn't knock his door down. What if he wanted to stay home? So, you know, Sonny Lubick, when I was coming out of high school in Northern Colorado and I high school in Boulder County, but still in Northern Colorado, uh, he made a point to every single kid that Gary Barnett was recruiting. He was going after two. And, you know, when, when he recruited Joel Dreesen over, you know, Quinn Simnuski and then CU picked Quinn, an Iowa kid over Dreesen, and Dreesen was, is a better player than Quinn Simnuski, both pros, but you know, Dreesen is a hell of a football player and a great, uh, you know, w- was a, a great uh, teammate as well as rival. He would recruit, well, Colorado doesn't want you, we'll come to Fort Collins and, and we'll, you know, we'll help us beat their ass. So those teams were different, man. Those CSU teams in the early 2000s, the era I played in was, it was brutal. Those were absolute dogfights. So... CSU needs to get a little bit of that mentality back. I think they they got some dogs for sure. I mean, they brought the fight to Colorado this year, but Colorado's just got dudes, and those dudes are named Shador and Travis Hunter. Probably two two out of the top ten players in the country, in my opinion. And we'll we'll uh, transition into uh, Colorado. Um, You had mentioned on the Coach JB show. I don't know if it. It bothered you a little bit. You brought up the fight song, and I don't have – I can't show the video on here, but when KU beat Oklahoma, that lo- there's a locker room video out there of them dudes yep. screaming that fight song. Yep. And where I went to high school, even though I didn't play past my freshman year, I was a baseball guy, but I love football. Um, it was a big thing, even though we weren't very good – it was a big thing to stand on the bleachers after the game and face the crowd and sing the fight song because that's your school. And I think that's why, you know, a lot of people say you have the fan goggles on. No, you were it, you were there, you were in the trenches. And I feel like the fight song, it means something different to the guys that played. You held the last bowl trophy. It means something different to the guys that played at CU. Well, it's the the song's different. It's not <clears throat> the song you you sing in the in the stands is like next to your mom like yeah and at the end you get to feel a little guilty and all the fucking frat boys are like oh fuck them up fuck them up go see you oh that's so cute but the way that we used to sing it is different and i can't even explain it and it was a rite of passage where the young guys would try and sing it and the older guys would show them how it's done and you know after they beat nebraska after they beat tcu they didn't sing it after they beat nebraska they did. I was in the locker room. After they beat CSU, they didn't. And I understand there was concern for Travis, but it should have been a very ruckus atmosphere where they were singing that song. And I just think it's an important part of the culture at the university, regardless of who the coach is. So, you know, it, it's not it's not my call, but I think it would be important. And fan goggles are, uh, what are those? Yeah. I don't know what those are. I'm not a fan. Yeah. Um, and and I think what Dion's building out there is something special that I think the college football world is getting a look at. And then when it's gone, it's going to be gone. And I, I just feel like he has completely saved a program, which is great for everybody. I must have lost Matt. Uh oh, I must have lost Matt somewhere. But like I was saying, uh, I I feel like uh, Dion is only creating a great. Uh, a great culture up in Boulder. And I feel like it is a, uh, 
saying that college football gets a college football gets a rare glimpse at and uh that is that uh, I had a couple more questions for Matt but maybe he'll rejoin and maybe I'll get him and um that is that All right, everybody, that was Big Matt. He must be having some technical difficulties. Um, I'll try to get him back on um, to see see if we can't finish that conversation. But this is the Andre Duke Show. Hit the like and subscribe, everybody. Have a good one.